Yeah, I, I can see it. Okay, good. So uh, let, let me quickly step through the slides. Let's see. Uh, Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, okay, good. So we're all set. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so can I ask a question? So how, how should I pronounce your name? Uh, Puan. 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 It's okay. like a P, the H is silent. Puan. 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 Puan, yeah. Okay. You just think of uh, Spanish Juan. I see. Juan. Puan. Puan. Yeah. So, thanks. Yeah, so, so we were starting to uh, 30. But usually people will come late, so yeah. we will yeah. probably start at thirty three hours. How, how long is the talk? Uh, you, you can go. Minutes. You can go as long as you want, like ninety. As long minutes. as I want. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so maybe 45, 50 minutes, and then. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, that, 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 yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Please feel free to take time to illustrate, explain. If you sorry. Uh, please, please feel free to take more time or take time okay. to explain. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. audience not just from uh, ITC community or condensed math community, there could be some uh, quantum field theories or mathematicians. I see. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So it's a, it's a fairly mixed uh, audience. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you for the invitation. <laughs> That's sex. Uh, yeah. uh, I think we can have a rest now. You can come back later. Yeah, okay. We, we still probably have 10 minutes. All right, okay. Okay, we will come back in 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay, see you. Yeah.
Same point. Yeah. How oh, hi, Patrick. <laughs> hi, how are you? Very good. So the proposal went in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, great, great. So we'll see what happens. Yeah, yeah I goofed up in the final week. You know, I forgot to prepare the subcontract. Yeah, so I think it was finally went okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's awful having all these balls in the air. <laughs> I know, you must be busy. So yeah, yeah, busy doesn't describe it. <laughs> <laughs> so are you still going to write up this? Uh, I guess you're going to talk about this uh, plane the whole day. Yeah. Are you yeah. going to write it up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If okay. I find the time, yeah, yeah, I'm going to write up soon. Yeah. Okay, very good. Yeah, but I'll show all the data. You know, I'd mm -hmm. like to get your view as well. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Hey, boy. Hi, Luli. Hey, how are you? Good, good. Good to see you. Going to see your longer version here. Yeah. I can see a corner of your room. Yeah, you see the uh, <laughs> table elements. <laughs> yeah. Do you see the table elements? Table of elements. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a special one. The um, the rare earth. They, they shift the elements to the to 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 the um to the right side. I see. I see. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Looking forward to your talk. Thanks. Uh, hi, Paul. Uh, if you are ready, maybe we can start now. Sure, when you're ready, yeah. Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Uh, do, we, do, do you need to start recording? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our today's seminar uh, at the MSA. Uh, today, it's our great pleasure to have Professor uh, Paul Ong uh, as our speaker. So, Professor Paul uh, is now at the uh, Princeton University. Uh, he has made uh, uh, many important contributions in condensed matter experiments, uh, such as in HTC corporate, in topological insulator, in wire semimeter. Uh, today, he will talk about his recent uh, thermal transport experiment on a Kitab material after Rusinate Clara. Uh, welcome, Professor Paul. The, uh, please. Okay. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, so I understand this is a fairly broad a general audience. So uh, I, I may spend some time, well, I've been encouraged to talk more about the background. Uh, okay, and, and if, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to do so. So uh, here, here are my um, collaborators. The experiments are led by Peter Checker, my current student, and Tong Gao, former student with a lot of help from a former student who's now at Reken, uh, Max Hirschberger. And this is in collaboration with the group at uh, Tennessee, University of Tennessee and uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, led by uh, David Mendris and Steve Negler with a uh, crystal work spearheaded by Paige Lempen Kelly and uh, Yu Chen Yan with a lot of input from uh, Arnab Banerjee. Okay, so uh, very quickly, uh, I'll first uh, talk about, the, uh, give you the background to the Kitayev honeycomb model for the quantum spin liquid, and uh, then zero in rapidly to ruthenium chloride. Um, then I'll talk about its phase diagram and the location of the quantum spin liquid state within. Uh, then I'll talk about our finding of a, uh, uh, very large oscillations in the thermal conductivity um, in the longitudinal 
thermal conductivity in a magnetic field, in an in-plane magnetic field. And uh, then follow up with the planar Hall effect, uh, focusing on you know, what, what, what is its nature and in fact, is there half quantization? Some of these results have appeared uh, recently in Nature Physics uh, um, a few months ago. And I acknowledge generous support from the Moore Foundation, from the Department of Energy, and from the National Science Foundation. Okay, so uh, for the background, uh, spin liquids were theoretically discovered by Phil Anderson. A uh, long time ago in 73. And the basic idea, so here's a photograph of Phil in his uh, 96th birthday. The, the waiter brought out the birthday cake with just one candle because we clearly couldn't fit all 96 in, into the, onto the cake. Um, uh, yeah, so I think everyone had a very good time. So the notion of spin liquid uh, depends on this notion of geometric frustration. And the simplest uh, illustration of that is uh, afforded by the triangular lattice, right? So you have a antiferromagnetic exchange of all local moments on this uh, triangular lattice. And you quickly realize that you can't keep all the nearest neighbors uh, satisfied with regard to the central spin, right? Because if it's anti-aligned to the red sublattice, it's uh, aligned with the white sublattice. So it, it can never satisfy everyone. So this is known as geometric frustration. Uh, and Anderson proposed that uh, the wave function is actually a comprised of singlet bonds uh, that he called resonating valence bonds, an idea that he, he adapted from um, Pauling. Um, but the wave functions are highly entangled. So even at the lowest temperature that one can achieve in the lab, uh, there's no long range order. There's never a phase transition in the ideal spin liquid. Even if you have very strong antiferromagnetic exchange, right? So th these are interacting spins that can't uh, form long range order on account of the geometric frustration. So this problem uh, is today one of the big uh, challenge challenges uh, to condensed matter physics. And uh, theoretical headway and experimental headway has been very difficult, but it's thought that maybe 30 compounds are strong candidates for being spin liquids. But we are no closer to understanding uh, how to attack the problem because there aren't small parameters. More importantly, there is not a mean field, right? In conventional magnets, you can adopt the wise mean field approach and assume that there is long range order. But here it's not possible. So one uh, struggle, one, one uh, possible approach was introduced by Anderson, uh, again, building on work uh, from Pierce Coleman, Stuart Barnes, and even going back to Abrikosov. Then you can break up the electron into its uh, spin full part, which can be identified to be a fermion. So Anderson called this a spin on, uh, as well as a spinless part that carries the charge. Uh, it's called a boson or holon. Now the two ten entities would then want to come back together and we express the interaction by this internal vector gauge. So the idea here is that, you know, if you now separate out the spin from the charge, you can at least attempt to do a mean field approximation focusing on the charge density distribution. Right. So with uh, mixed uh, success and lots of challenges. So all this is summarized in this excellent book by uh, Zhang Hongwen, uh, which, which is probably mapping out you know, one of the future directions of all of uh, strong correlation physics. So this uh, spin charge separation today is called the parton representation. And uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a spin on and a hold on. So the, the idea for experimentalists uh, in all these uh, past decades is, can we actually detect, uh, are these real, right? Are the spin-ons real? And if they are, they will occupy a Fermi surface and perhaps one can use all the well-known techniques of quantum oscillations to detect its presence. So th this has been a beacon, uh, although a very difficult beacon sitting on top of a very difficult hill for experiments. Now, in the, starting in the uh, mid 
2000s, uh, uh, Alexei Kitayev introduced a new chapter into spin liquids by writing down this Hamiltonian, which is now called the Kitayev honeycomb model, uh, where the it's basically an Ising model, but the exchange term is bond specific. So the X components have a different exchange than the Y component and the Z component. So uh, writing this somewhat uh, artificial Hamiltonian, Kitayev using uh, Majorana representation. So let me say a few words. Uh, so on every uh, site of this hexagonal honeycomb lattice, you have a local moment, right? A electron spin, but now you break it up into two types of Majoranas. The uh, C Majoranas are on the side, on the bond, uh, close to the B Majorana, which is uh, located in the center, right? So by using this uh, representation and introducing new operators, plaquette operators, sort of, uh, Kitayev could actually write the Hamiltonian as a, uh, by quadratic uh, in the by quadratic form for the C Majoranas, and then he could achieve an exact solution uh, at, at, at zero field. Uh, very important to emphasize that. So the exact solution for this Hamiltonian is known, and the excitations above the ground state he found to be Majoranas and vortices. So this was a very exciting uh, theoretical result, and many experimentalists. Uh, when look for materials that could uh, duplicate this Hamiltonian. But uh, two theorists at Max Planck, uh, Stuttgart, Jacqueline and Karl Julian, uh, were, were successful. So they, they realized the physical uh, realization of the Kitayev Hamiltonian um, by focusing on transition metal oxides that have edge shared tetrahedra. I'll show you the sketch in a little bit. So here, here's a cartoon of how that might happen. So here's the honeycomb lattice, right? And uh, it's bond specific, specific. So on the green bond, the two uh, adjacent spins have an Ising exchange uh, and that wants to point them in the direction uh, indicated by the green arrow and so on for the red bond and the blue bond, right? Okay. So uh, rapidly after Kaliulin's uh, theory, uh, two compounds were, were found that actually uh, were suitable candidates. Uh, the, the one that has been really viable as a workhorse is a ruthenium chloride. Its lattice structure is layered and within a layer, which is the AB plane, yeah, here the axis, uh, it's a uh, honeycomb lattice as advertised, right? So here's the top down view. And the local moments sit on the ruthenium sites. These gray circles are ruthenium ions. And you see they occupy a honeycomb uh, motif. The next layer up is slipped by half a lot of spacing yeah, into the page. And the ne next one is slipped even further, right? So you need three layers to define a unit cell. Now in, in poorly grown crystals, you could have, instead of ABC stacking, as this is called, you could have ABAB. So this is called a stacking fault. Uh, yeah, but, but I, I won't talk much about it. So the Kitayev axis, the spin axis are actually tilted out of the plane as indicated by these three uh, red, green, and blue arrows, right? So it's uh, convenient to think of the of the planes that are perpendicular to each of these axes. So for example, the red direction defines the plane normal to it that I've shaded in pink, right? And the blue is perpendicular to the blue plane. Okay, so, so this, this is a, another perspective where I have made the red axis vertical and you see now that its plane is horizontal. Now the Kalulin mechanism with Jekyll uh, is the following. Uh, you know, for these two ruthenium atoms to, to interact, uh, there are two equivalent paths, right? Uh, super exchange paths. So it goes through the chlorine and then you know, goes up and then down, but it could equally go down and then up, right? So these two paths are exactly equal and therefore they interfere. And, and Kalulin showed that they actually 
interfere in a destructive way, and that kills the direct exchange, the direct super exchange. So that leaves then the, the, uh, the uh, um, Kitayev term to become dominant. Um, actually, the truth of the matter is that uh, there are other terms uh, present called the gamma terms that conspire to prevent the spin liquid from happening in zero magnetic field. The system actually orders antiferromagnetically at a very low temperature, seven Kelvin, uh, it, despite the Kitayev terms, right? Because of these additional uh, auxiliary terms, gamma terms, uh, they, they order uh, antiferromagnetically. Okay, so this is shown here in the physical phase diagram. If you cool in zero, so this is a plot in the plane of temperature versus field. If you cool in zero field, it, under, it has a sharp transition here at seven Kelvin, around seven, and then uh, goes into this antiferromagnetic state in which the ruthenium local moments have uh, a zigzag motive. Uh, so, you know, one along one zigzag branch, it, it points to the right and on the adjacent one, it points to the left. And the moments are actually not in plane, they are tilted out of the plane, but, but they are all parallel. So we will talk very frequently about the AB axis. Uh, I just want to affirm that A is along the zigzag direction. That's a important direction and B is perpendicular to it. Uh, in graphene, this would be called the armchair direction. Uh, there is a minor phase of the zigzag ordering that was discovered by the Oak Ridge group, uh, now called ZZ2, but regardless, it's still ordered. Then there's a very sharp transition. Now you apply a magnetic field along the zigzag direction, right this way, and uh, you kill the ordering. And it's thought that this whole region colored in orange, red, is uh, a quantum spin liquid. There aren't any sharp excitations uh, as seen by neutron diffraction or by spin resonance and so on. So this is a very broad spectrum, highly disordered. And you know many researchers consider this to be a quantum spin liquid. All right, so to recall Kitayev's uh, solution, his exact solution referred to this line, and surely this field is now too strong to make that solution uh, relevant, right? And, and no one knows how to solve the problem with these uh, auxiliary terms in the Hamiltonian, and in addition, the very strong magnetic field. So this is so far uh, an unsolved problem. But if the field gets too large, then all the local moments are, are polarized and that abruptly destroys the hypothetical quantum spin liquid. Okay, so I think I've covered all these points here. Uh, yeah, so an in-plane field along the zigzag axis will kill the zigzag order. Now, um, despite the, the uh, irrelevance of the Kitayev exact solution, the field was uh, very energized by this report by the group in Kyoto, uh, led by Matsuda, that uh, observed a half quantized uh, kappa xy, exactly predicted by Kitayev, right? So these were thought, th this half quantization result uh, were thought to be, well, sort of a confirmation of the zero field solution. And, and so the, the, the field has been in a high, state of agitation uh, and excitement since then. Uh, and so we wanna address this in the second half of the talk. Okay, now let me go on to our experiment. Uh, yeah, so for this slide, uh, this is just to show the mounting and, and all the uh, usual things that come with it. And, and I think this is, this is clear to anyone who has seen a a charge transport Hall effect, right? So uh, I just wanted to make sure that everyone is, uh, understands the relation between thermal conductivity matrix and the conductivity matrix. So uh, the conductivity, thermal conductivity matrix relates to driving uh, 
force, if you wish, right, which in this case is the temperature, applied temperature gradient, and the response is the, the linear response is the thermal current. Uh, however, experimentalists do not measure this. Uh, they measure resistivity, right? The analog of the resistivity. So the analog of thermal uh, of charge resistivity matrix is uh, called lambda. We call it lambda. So we measure the, the longitudinal uh, temperature drop. This is equivalent to the longitudinal voltage, right? And so this would be rho xx, right? In response to the applied uh, current density, the thermal current density. The Hall effect, uh, we measure the transverse gradient. Oh yeah, with reference to this cartoon. So the heat current is applied vertically downwards and you can either measure the longitudinal temperature drop, which is Delta XT or the transverse, which is the Hall effect, uh, Delta YT, right? So this would, this would be the well-known rho YX that underlies the quantum Hall effect. But after we measure this, we then uh, compose the thermal resistivity matrix. Then we invert it and we calculate kappa x1. This seems like an obvious statement, but uh, I, I wanted to make a point later on. Right? So, so here, here it is. We measure the thermal resistivity matrix and then we invert it to get the thermal conductivity matrix. So I'll return to this point towards the second half the talk. All right, now I'm gonna to cut to our finding uh, uh, right away. So when, when uh, Peter cooled, Peter and Tong cooled down the sample, uh, starting at four and a half Kelvin, they noticed this very strange phenomenon. Uh, you start to see rather strong oscillations and they become more and more intense as you cool down. Remember Kappa XX, has a temperature prefactor. So, you know, the, the overall intensity decreases, but the relative magnitude of the oscillations uh, increases, right, very dramatically. So we can go down in my lab down to about half a Kelvin, and you can see that by, at the base temperature, it really is a huge fraction of the total conductivity. The thermal conductivity, uh, maybe not not necessary to emphasize, is the linear combination of spin excitations and phonons, right? So these two uh, carry the thermal conductivity. There are no free electrons, right? Absolutely zero. It's exponentially suppressed by several tens of orders of magnitude. So this is a very good insulator. And uh, seeing these oscillations, which remind us of Shubnikov de Haas was a, uh, was a uh, very puzzling uh, encounter. And so we, we sat on the result for about a year while uh, Peter and Tong checked everything that could possibly go wrong, right? So this was such a, such a unexpected result that something must be wrong. You know, it's either the thermometry or whatever. Anyway, um, now we're convinced it's true. Uh, uh, here, I want to note another thing. When you go above 12 Tesla, roughly, it's flat, it's a plateau. And this plateau is actually very useful. Uh, so now in this regime, going back to the phase diagram, this is in the fully polarized state where there are no quantum spin liquid remnants, right? So the, there are no magnons because all the moments are now increasingly locked to the field direction. So this is, we think, a predominantly phononic current, right? So uh, I'll return to this point later on. So all the samples show a beautiful plateau once you get cold enough and the field exceeds 12 Tesla. So the first thing to note is the amplitude, right? So we calculate the amplitude by basically Threading, or let me, let me return. Yeah, let, let, let me return to the previous slide. You, you, you thread a average curve through the oscillations and then subtract uh, that average background. So this isolates the amplitude. Uh, so now you can call that the amplitude function. And we can then see how it varies as we go through the various phases. Uh, you, you see that 
So the amplitude function is shown here as the blue circles. It drops very abruptly. Once you exceed, once you kill the spin liquid phase and you enter the fully polarized state, it's all gone, right? It's not just a slow decay, it's absolutely uh, squashed. So this is, remember, is what I call the plateau region from before. Uh, and, uh, but then once you go uh, into the audit phase, which is at seven Tesla, there's still a remnant, right? A little tiny finger that, that pokes into the zigzag phase. We think this is evidence for a mixed phase, that the quantum spin liquid coexists with the uh, zigzag phase. And then initially we thought, well, this implies a first order transition, right? At the uh, field suppression. And there was no evidence for it. But then in, in the past few months or past year, uh, very careful magnetocaloric experiments have shown that indeed this transition is first order when, when, it, when it loses the zigzag order. So there is a, a finger that, that, that goes into the zigzag phase that abruptly ends at four Tesla. Now between samples, so this is one and this is three, right? You, you see very large uh, differences in the amplitude. Here, uh, the amplitude, let's say it's about four, sorry, it's the right axis. It's about 0.1 or 0.9. And here it's only, uh, it, it's a lot smaller. Yeah, sorry, Peter has sort of mixed up the units. All right, so anyway, uh, we'll, 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 we'll see that in a, in, a, in a bit. So in sample three, the amplitude is very large. And it will turn out that its uh, plateau value is also very large. Uh, but now you see that this tail is correspondingly smaller, right? So this led us to think that whatever is causing the oscillations it is really belonging in, in inherent to the quantum spin liquid phase, right? Just by looking at how you kill its amplitude, you, you are basically forced into that conclusion. Um, yeah, so th these two statements are basically expressing what I just said. Uh, more surprisingly, the oscillations are periodic in one over H, right? Not like H, right? I'll show you later that periodicity in linear H can be absolutely ruled out. Uh, when you do the famous Landau index plot, where you plot the integer increments, right? These are just the integers with arbitrary origin versus the uh, reciprocal field, it falls on a straight line. Uh, in this material, there's a break in slope, a very distinct break in slope that happens exactly at when you kill the zigzag phase at seven Tesla. We don't Professor, know why can I interrupt you just for a second with a clarifying question? Sure, sure. Uh, Natasha Perkinson. Uh, on the previous slide, you said that this plateau at very high uh, magnetic field is mostly due to phonons. But I don't think it's a fully saturated state because, I mean, if you will look for magnetization, it's far from being uh, saturated and you have all these uh, bond anisotropic interactions. So why you think that all this kind of mostly- oh, Remember, we, we, are, we are concerned with the magnon contribution, right? So even though it's not fully saturated, the magnon uh, excitations must be severely uh, uh, decreased uh, in, in, in this regime. That's the only way we can understand why it's a plateau. There's absolutely no change in the total thermal conductivity as you keep on increasing field. I think some groups have taken this to 30 Tesla and seen no change. So it's a very natural in inference that the magnons are completely suppressed. It's dominated by phonons. That, that's all I'm saying. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, here. Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead with questions. Yeah, because, yeah. Uh, yeah. So the, when the spin are fully polarized, uh, do you imply the conductance, thermal conductance actually is higher uh, when the spin is not fully polarized uh, with the magnet contribution, thermal conductance are lower? Uh, is that what you mean? Yeah, the, the, the relative magnitudes are kind of uh, uh, difficult to, you know, no one has succeeded, right, in, in, in actually putting this on a model because the, the spin uh, uh, state is totally unknown in this regime, right? So. The way we understand it is that uh, uh, 
there is intense uh, phonon spin scattering throughout this whole region. And that's why the thermal conductivity oh, is lowish. Okay. But once you polarize the moments, and this is yet another piece of evidence in okay. response to the first question, it's like the phonons are released and look at this enormous increase okay. at, at 1.5 Kelvin. This is a jump of a factor of 20. That's how we think about it. Yeah. But there, there aren't any detailed model calculations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are there other questions? Since I'm at liberty, so since there's no time limit, I can, I can pause to really uh, explain every point or, or, or uh, respond to every question that arises. So feel free to interrupt. Can I maybe ask uh, on that slide? So, so how do you understand the difference between these two samples then in terms of what's going on with the- uh, That'll come later. Yeah, yeah, good okay. question. So hold that thought. I will come back to it when, when I revisit the plateau. Cool, thanks. Okay, so, uh, uh, so this is purely experimental, right? So when you see oscillations at low temperatures that, that are periodic, it's very natural to try out the, the Landau plot. And uh, here I'm showing five sets of data, uh, artificially, what's the word for it, displaced, to, for clarity, right? Uh, but they all actually fall on the same straight lines. Uh, th th this is to convince uh, folks that it's reproducible. Uh, the, the, the data are spread over three crystals and over three field orientations for one crystal and so on. So uh, uh, we convince ourselves that this was really an intrinsic phenomenon. Okay, I, I won't go into the details of the tilt angles until later. Uh, okay, so the points are that they mimic Landau level quantization oscillations. There are no free electrons. The energy gap, the charge gap has been measured by RPES and it's two electron volts, right? So you can do the math with the two volts uh, at one Kelvin, you know, it's exponentially suppressed. Um, so you can also read out a Fermi surface area. It's roughly 30 Tesla below or 31. And then above it's either 41 Tesla in Fermi surface area or 64, depending on the angle relative to uh, in plane, in plane angle. A, point, a quick question, this is a loop. Yeah. Um, does the overview field matter or does the one project along the A field, A direction matter? We, we, we believe it's the A component. So you have one setup along B direction. Uh, yeah, yeah, an in-plane component, correct. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's the in-plane component that matters. Okay. You notice that the, the armchair and the uh, zigzag are not orthogonal. Right? That's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, 30 degrees, yeah. I see, yeah, thanks. Uh, can I also ask a question? Yeah. This uh, 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 plateau uh, if you uh, attribute the phonons, if you plot this temperature dependence, does it follow standard uh, dependence which we expect for phonons? Temperature Again, dependence of, if, if temperature plot, dependence of the uh, uh, at plateau. Well, at the plateau. At plateau, yeah. yeah. Plateau. You said that it's phonons. Does it follow standard? Uh, uh, we, we haven't checked that. Yeah, we have to check that. You, you mean like it goes like TQ? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, have, we haven't done that. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that, that really, yeah, that, that point is secondary to, to what we want to say. Yeah. Right. We, we have the, the, the phenomenon here has little to do with what happens at high fields. I, I bring this up only to uh, address uh, lattice quality, which will come later. Sorry, one more question here. Yeah. Uh, so if it's, uh, if it's a um, kind of a shrubinker de gas, um, is there any chance to try a lichus kasevich formula or? Yeah, yeah, we, we have done that. I'll come back to that at the very end. Uh, right. Yeah, so in a word, it does. Uh -huh. the, the, from the dingle temperature, you get the effective mass, it's about, Two thirds of a free electron mass. I see. Yeah, if, okay. if it had come up to be a thousand electron mass, or you know one thousandth of an electron mass, then you say, well, something's wrong. Right? 
but it seems to remember its origin. It's roughly electron mass. To experimentalists, this is quite expected, you know, because the temperature scales and the field scales are all that we expect from- Right, they're kind of electronic, electronic scales, yes. Yeah, so it, it, it is sort of like an electronic oscillation, but I'll, I'll come back to that. So uh, reproducibility and phasing, so on, right? So we, we obtained the previous Landau plots. Sorry, this jumped ahead. We, we, we extracted the Landau plots by plotting the extrema of the derivative, right? So this is the derivative of the kappa xx with respect to field. And we're just reading off the max and the minimum for all those plots, right? But even this eyeballing these five sets of data, you can sort of see that, you know, they are, they are actually keeping the same phase and the same period, right? There could be a little error due to experimental resolution and then appearance of minor peaks. But by and large, uh, you know, if you, uh, yeah, they, they, they seem to be very consistent. Moreover, if you take the two samples that have the largest oscillations, one and three, so these were the two that one of the questions were directed at, you see that the oscillation extrema actually match with an experimental resolution over the whole few range, right? Remember I said that the oscillations begin at four, then they extend up to seven into the, the spin liquid phase, and then they continue until they die out, until they are squashed by the polarization. Uh, so we, we think that this is intrinsic. And, and in fact, uh, uh, yeah, I'll come back to this point later. So this plot is to convince folks that it's not periodic in H, right? If it were, you wouldn't have this downwards divergence, right? It, it, the, the periodicity is really in one over H and not in H. And this hints at a quantum phenomenon, right? Because periodicity in one over H implies a, an area in K space. Right, so it's uh, yeah. So so this is this is uh, perhaps a key point. Well, I have a clarifying question about this. This is Young back. Uh, yeah. So when you are plotting this data for the tilted angle, are you plotting it only in terms of in-plane component of the field or the total field? Uh, in the tilted, yeah. Thank you. In the tilted experiments, is the in-plane field. So only the in-plane component. Okay. Yeah, in-plane component. You. Yeah, depending on A or B, as the case may be. Okay. Like, all the tilt angles are with the in-plane component along the zigzag along A. So it's one over H A. I see. I see. And another quick question, if possible. I'm sorry, it's a. Um, is the data is good enough to see the Anzager phase? I mean, if you extrapolate from strong field to to the axis uh, to the intercept. Ah, okay. You mean the uh, approaching the quantum limit? Right, right, right. Yes. Oh, we, we can't do that because the <laughs> you know <laughs> this this is like a phenomenon that if you if you watch it too closely, you kill it, right? So to do that, you need to go to extremely high fields. And see, by the time right. you exceed 12 Tesla, you've killed the, uh, you've killed everything. So we can't, yeah, we can't really chase it down to the lowest uh, Landau level. Average, yeah. That, that's too bad. Actually, we, we, we truly wanted that, but maybe. But if you extrapolate uh, to, uh, to uh, one over H uh, equals zero. Yeah, so here's the extrapolation. Yeah, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it completely depends on what origin you choose. I see. Integer. Okay. Other questions? Okay, so let me now I'll come back to this. Uh, you know, what's the difference between sample one and sample three? So in a word, it's uh, the, the, the sample quality. Now in, in the old days, right, when we were studying semi-metal uh, Landau oscillations, the, the obvious measure of sample quality is what's called the triple R, which is residual resistivity ratio, right? You simply compare the resistance measured at room temperature 
with that at four Kelvin, take the ratio. And that's a very good yardstick for telling you what is the transport lifetime, transport mean free path. Here we are missing that yardstick, uh, but uh, we found one that's actually, that actually does the job we believe, but it's a bit awkward to use, uh, but let me explain it. All right. So this is what we call a benchmark. Uh, here, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that groups will follow up our experiments and really confirm or invalidate our findings. But you need to follow this benchmark because this will save you a lot of time and liquid helium. Liquid helium is very, very expensive. These series of experiments must have cost me, I forget, 200,000, maybe half a million dollars in liquid helium. So here's the benchmark, right? So with our hypothesis that magnons are suppressed above 12 Tesla, the phonon conductivity is dominant, right? Now phonons are very good at sampling lattice quality. So the absolute magnitude at the plateau is a proxy, is a proxy for the triple R. It really sniffs out the quality of the lattice and reports back how clean it is. And indeed it does its job here. Sample one, the plateau at one Kelvin, one Kelvin just for you know, reference, right? At one Kelvin has this value, which uh, is roughly 0.7. So I think I reported here. Yeah, sample one, it's 0.7, right? And in sample three, the plateau at one Kelvin is about uh, two, 2, 2.1 actually here, right? So they differ by a factor of uh, roughly three, of three, right? So they differ by three, and indeed the amplitude also differs roughly by three, it's actually more, more like a factor of uh, five, maybe more, yeah, slightly more. So the, the amplitude depends critically on how clean your crystal is. And this reminds you of Landau oscillations, right? The cleaner you make your crystal, your semi-metal, the uh, larger the triple R and the more pronounced the Shubnikov oscillations. And here it looks like it's doing the same thing. So uh, um, groups that want to follow up these experiments should always, the first thing to do is to cool it down and measure the kappa XX plateau and, and, and get its value. If it doesn't fall within this range, you probably won't see much of an oscillation. So here, this is like a roadmap that hopefully will be very convenient. So to summarize the first part of the talk, the oscillations are, are one over H, right? And except for a break in slope at seven Tesla. And it, it really invites a Landau level interpretation. The period predominantly depends on the A axis component Oh, I, I skipped over that slide. But anyway, in, in these tilted uh, experiments, it, it only cares about the A-axis component. It's strongly reproducible. Uh, and I've shown by the benchmark 0.6, uh, how to measure the uh, purity of the crystal in your sample. Um, it is, the amplitude is largest within the spin liquid phase. And it seems to be a characteristic of the quantum spin liquid state. Uh, when you kill the state in strong fields, it's gone. It's gone very abruptly, but then there's a weak tail that persists down to four Tesla into the zigzag phase, suggestive of a weekly first order transition into a mixed phase. Uh, and I haven't shown this, that they damp out very rapidly above four Kelvin. This was in, in the initial slide, right? You saw that the oscillations do not become resolved until you cool below four Kelvin. Okay, so I need to say a little bit about the theory, uh, although there's not much theory yet, uh, just, just to, um, yeah, to see how, how we're thinking about this. Uh, as I mentioned, there's this parton representation where you force the electron to split up into a spin-on and a holon, right? Uh, interacting with a very strong internal gauge field. And uh, when you write it out, that's the operator form, right? Phi 
creates the holon or destroys the holon and psi destroys the spinon. Now, when you perform a gauge transformation, you see that on account of this product, the, the phase angles have to be opposite in sign, right? So this immediately tells you that the internal gauge, if you express it as a internal magnetic field, must be opposite in sign to the external field. And uh, several groups, in particular, the one at MIT uh, involving Sod Inti Soderman, Chaudhary and Sento, building on earlier work of uh, Motronich, they've kind of carried this uh, further. And I, I won't go through the calculations because you see later on that it may not be entirely appropriate to the experiment. But what they predict is the existence of Landau quantization by the internal field of a neutral Fermi surface that one can hope to detect by Schubnikov of the Haas, um, mostly by the Haas van Elfen, sorry. And uh, um, so th this, this sort of guided our thinking, except that here, the idea was that the field should be, the internal field, right, should be perpendicular to the plane. But remember the relevant field in ruthenium chloride is in plane in the zigzag direction. So this, yeah, this, this requires more development of the theory uh, along these lines. Now, let, let, let me, let me uh, switch to the planar Hall effect. The thermal Hall effect uh, in ruthenium chloride was first done by Matsuda's group and they uh, observed a quantization, right? So I think everyone is now familiar with this, uh, this result. So the idea is that, you know, you apply a temperature gradient, it directed at the, uh, let me see what their, what their uh, geometry is. Yeah, so the, the, the temperature gradient applied is actually along this direction, right? With the magnetic field perpendicular to the layers, and then this will detect an edge Hall effect, Hall current that you can actually measure with transverse thermometry. So they see that uh, interestingly within this uh, field region four to five Tesla, uh, it's, uh, it seems to be um, quantized, at least consistent with half quantization. Now remember the, the crystal is very thick. So we are talking about, you know, a thousand, maybe 10,000 honeycomb layers, but within, you can divide that out of course, but within the measurement accuracy, uh, it seems to be consistent. But now when, when we saw this result, uh, we thought, well, why, why didn't they go colder than 3.7 Kelvin, right? They're, they're certainly capable of doing that. In fact, the whole data set it's confined to a two Kelvin interval. And surely one can ex extend that, um, we, which is what we set out to do, right? Um, a note about the mirror symmetry. Uh, it turns out that if you are within the honeycomb layer, there is a mirror plane uh, drawn here uh, that is normal to the B axis, right? It's clearly, this is a mirror plane. And that has uh, consequences for the thermal Hall effect. So in, in the planar thermal Hall effect, you apply a temperature gradient to drive a, a heat current along, let's say the A axis, and you search for a uh, temperature gradient perpendicular to it. And this gradient hopefully changes sign with your applied magnetic field. But you see then the field in the planar geometry, the field is actually parallel in plane, it's in plane. Normally you should see no Lorentz force Hall effect, but uh, Matsuda's group had reported that, that it, it exists in a second paper, which recently appeared in science. So a word about that. So, uh, uh, the, B, the B vector, of course, is axial, and the other two vectors, the temperature gradient and the heat current, are both polar, right? So if there's a mirror plane, when you apply a temperature gradient, the driving uh, gradient uh, along the A axis, uh, its mirror image is in the same direction. But the Hall effect, if it exists, 
will change direction, right? When reflected, because it's polar. However, the magnetic field, if you were to align it along the B axis, remember that's the one that is perpendicular to the mirror, uh, it's being axial, it will not change in direction, right? So the B axis, uh, uh, sorry, the B axis magnetic field will preserve mirror symmetry and that immediately kills the uh, Hall effect. Now, let, let me repeat their argument. So B being axial does not break the mirror symmetry. Therefore, the Hall response, the thermal conductivity response in the Hall direction cannot exist, right? Because it would, it would violate mirror symmetry. However, if the magnetic field is applied along the A axis, uh, it already breaks the mirror symmetry then that allows the thermal hall to exist, right? It allows it to exist. It doesn't mean that it's going to be observed, right? It just allows it by symmetry. It turns out that this simple argument is, is beautifully um, uh, observed. This was first reported by Matsuda's group, actually. Uh, if you align the magnetic field along the B axis, a uh, small delta Y is our thermal hall signal, right? It's equivalent to the voltage in a charge experiment. You see that to our resolution, there's nothing, right? At any temperature from 0.3 to 5 Kelvin, it's absolutely uh, zero. And, and Peter tells me that his recent data set is even cleaner than this uh, fluctuation. So we confirm that when you preserve the mirror symmetry by aligning the magnetic field uh, perpendicular to the mirror plane, there's no thermal Hall effect. Symmetry forbids it. Here's the surprise, right? When you align it parallel to the A axis, which breaks the mirror symmetry, then uh, this mysterious signal appears and it's real. You know, it's, it's not only not allowed by Lorentz force arguments, right? Because B is planar, it changes sign with the field, right? How does it know which direction to call right and left, right? But here it is. And, and Peter and Tong must have spent a, a year trying to get rid of it, but it's there. And, and it changes with temperature and field in this highly systematic way, which I now want to explain, right? So first of all, in this early set of data, which already has been published, you see that when you convert this cuspy uh, signal into kappa xy doing the matrix inversion I mentioned. Uh, it, it results in the dome-like structure, rather reminiscent of what Matsuda sees, but now extending to a much broader range of temperatures. Right? You see that below 3 Kelvin, it dies. Right? So it's very strongly temperature dependent, and it just sails through the window that Matsuda reported without changing, without quantizing, without pausing or uh, saturating, it just sails right through. Now, at the time we, when we took this data, we had rather large error bars. So I'm gonna show you more recent data that are somewhat cleaner. Um, so we, we would like to encourage all the groups there. And now there are quite a number of groups testing these findings. They should report the thermal hall resistivity. In fact, if you are a, theory, a referee for these, manuscripts, you should, uh, you should persuade the authors to publish the raw data. Now in, in the quantum hall experiments, electrical quantum hall experiments, you need not do that because the hall channel is so large, right? That uh, there's no chance of any error. But here the hall angle is extremely small as I'll mention later on. So it's absolutely necessary to report the thermal hall resistivity rather than simply the inferred thermal hall conductivity. Here, here are the measured values and you can see, you can see that uh, the data is just gorgeous. You know, the fluctuations are very small. Uh, yeah, I should point out that uh, these fluctuations correspond to 50 micro Kelvin with the sample at one Kelvin or any of these temperatures, right? It's a 50 micro, even smaller, 20 to 50 micro Kelvin between the two edges in a sweep that can last 10 hours. So the computer is controlling everything, making sure that there are no extraneous signals. 
Nonetheless, uh, once you get these curves and you convert it to kappa xy, you see that the error bars become very, very large right in the regime where quantization is supposed to be observed. So um, this is a pitfall that I think uh, all referees should focus on. Why, why, why does this happen? The reason is uh, when you invert the matrix, right? Remember this is measured, lambda yx, and kappa xy is inferred, right? Um, it turns out that because of this large difference, the, the Hall angle is tiny. They differ, these two terms differ by a factor of a thousand. So when you square it, the difference is a million. Uh, you can then drop this term and the, the published data, so to speak, is the measured quantity multiplied by this huge number, right? Which is a million fold larger. And any tiny error that you make in lambda gets amplified into a huge number, right? So without, without seeing the lambda yx, the data, if you just publish this with a smooth the curve is basically meaningless, right? You have to know what are the error bars in the measured quantity. Okay, that, that's our beef, that's, uh, that people should, should really show all the dirty laundry. Now, here, here's a, a map from 30,000 feet on the phase space. So Peter has actually measured this very carefully over the entire phase space, right? At, in fields from zero to 13 Tesla and up to 10 Kelvin from a base of uh, below one Kelvin. The resistivity is the measured quantity. And you see that the red region is where the signal is largest. Here's the color bar. And um, yeah, so it, it really is quite large all over the place uh, and gets smaller in, in the, uh, when you get out of the quantum spin liquid region. When you convert this to thermal hall conductivity, it becomes very ragged here, right? For reasons that I just mentioned. So it's hard to trust anything here on account of, uh, on account of the amplification I mentioned. Now, we've, so we, we found that a good way to organize the data, so there's, there's something like a hundred curves uh, summarized in the previous uh, color plot, but a good way we found, actually Peter found, to organize the, the huge amount of data is, uh, provided by this calculation of the thermal hall conductivity. So many groups have calculated the thermal hall conductivity, um, including one from uh, such Dev's group, which actually influenced my thinking quite a bit. But Murakami wrote it down very early, right? So he, he considered the case where there's a Berry curvature present, here's a sample. A Berry curvature points, let's say, perpendicular to the page and you consider a wave packet, and this wave packet will be confined to the edge, right? Because once it hits the wall, the wall is basically a steep ba uh, barrier. And in conjunction with the Berry curvature, you will produce the Luttinger velocity, right? This is the anomalous velocity that Luttinger introduced. And this velocity measures the wave packet velocity around the edge. So once you have that, you can put it into the quantum hall formalism, the edge formalism for the integer quantum hall and uh, turn the crank and you get the uh, total hall current, right? Basically, this is now looking at the uh, cross section, looking from this point of view, right? Looking from, the, from your right. And so you have the cool edge here and the warm edge here. So the warm edge will have a highly thermally activated occupation of this state. You start off with the wave packet energy in the bulk and it climbs the wall potential, but it's being occupied, dictated by the Bose-Einstein distribution. At the cooler edge, the occupation is rather weaker and therefore the heat current coming out of the page is much stronger on the warm edge than the cool edge, just like the quantum Hall effect. And here I've drawn it as a cartoon. The warm edge has a larger occupied heat current than the, than the cool edge. So putting these two together, you finally come up with the, uh, with the uh, expected kappa xy, and you can 
<clears throat> express the very curvature in terms of the churn number, right? So this is famously uh, done in the original Taurus paper, and you can just write it in this way. Now, this could have been fermionic. The formalism is exactly the same, right? If I replace rho by the fermionic distribution, this would just be delta F delta U, right? U is the renormalized energy. But uh, out of this integral, you can either use a Fermi-Dirac distribution or a Bose-Einstein distribution and see what describes the data, right? So it's like night and day. Uh, uh, so this is what uh, Peter discovered. And the data just uh, tells you categorically right, without any, any fudging that it's bosonic, right? So he, so he has plotted kappa xy divided by temperature just to make contact with the fermionic description. Then once you divide out by the temperature, there's no other temperature dependence, right? As, as Subir showed recently with this group. Uh, it should be flat, right? It shouldn't be confined to a narrow interval of temperature. The colder you get, the more dramatic this uh, constancy becomes. But the data says otherwise. Data is very temperature dependent. Each of these circles, remember, uh, is extracted from something like 10 curves, a fit to 10 curves. So it, it, it smoothly goes right through the quantization value and it's very temperature dependent. So it doesn't matter if our thermometry was miscalibrated or whatever, right? It, it could be distorted, but uh, the fact that it's temperature dependent when plotted in this way tells you that this cannot be half quantized. It's a boson mode which doesn't agree with the Kitayev expression, which is shown here. Uh, and it doesn't depend on the field. Uh, whatever the field is, and, and we have many, many field values, the fit is good. Uh, by the way, this is a two band fit. We had to assume uh, two bands with uh, opposite churn signs, uh, and we can achieve this fit. But that's basically just a correction for the higher temperatures where the uh, the curve is actually moving more slowly than the Murakami expression. Uh, moreover, the fit tells you the churn number, right? So if this had come out to be 100 or uh, 10,000, then say, well, something is amiss, but uh, it comes out to be one. So, okay, so here, 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 are more, here are more fits and for all field values. Uh, at the lowest uh, temperature, uh, we think something else is happening. I'm not so sure, but Peter is convinced that there's something else happening here where the quantum oscillations are observed. Remember the oscillations happen below four Kelvin and something seems to be kicking in, but we think we need even more accuracy to chase that tail. So here, as I mentioned, the fit delivers a churn number of one within our resolution. So it's not 10 or hundred or 0.01, right? So, so this makes sense. The churn number is one when you have the two dimensional results uh, plotted. Um, and, and finally, finally, what, what we find comforting is that uh, the energy scale, uh, let me step back a little bit. So implicit in this fit is the energy scale uh, of epsilon K in the bulk, right? So this gives you an energy of the, uh, of the spin wave packet and it comes into the integral. So that's the only parameter and you can pull it out and it's, uh, it agrees with electron spin resonance, uh, which is one millivolt. So this again is a, uh, is a, uh, a confirmation that the, the calibration and so on sample dimensions are fairly accurate. Uh, let me pause this. So the, Green circles are Peter's fit to the Murakami expression, and the gray and red purple dots are all from electron spin resonance measurements. At high fields, uh, the disagreement we believe comes from, you know, whether you're measuring the phonons, the, the magnons at the uh, Brillouin zone boundary or versus the center of the zone. But anyway, at, at uh, at the center of the zone, the agreement is very good. So lastly, uh, 
So I, I've talked oh, a lot, showed me. you a lot of data and showed you two rather disparate uh, phenomena, right? One, one refers to the quantum oscillations. Excuse me. Yeah. One, just yeah. to clarify, oh, so for hi, these calculations, hi. hi, how are you? So just to clarify for these calculations, you are assuming that the battery curvature is constant over K and, and what dispersion you're assuming? No, we, we, don't, we don't assume that. We just have the uh, battery curvature that once you, once you uh, carry out the integral, then the integral of the battery curvature basically is the churn number. Yeah, in, in other words, the K dependence isn't appearing under the integral. Yeah, that, that's the assumption, right? So, so if this, this integral is independent of K, I can pull it out, right? Then the, the integral of the Berry curvature over the whole Brillouin zone defines the churn number. Um, can, I, can I make uh, one comment? Sure. So, so uh, the way, you know, <clears throat> um, the way that the thermal hole conductivity Depends on temperature here, also the battery curvature. It's very similar to um, the no, Maglone no, no. contribution. No, no, sorry, it doesn't depend on the battery curvature. The weight temperature no, no. Omega okay, is right? from the distribution. You know, what I'm trying to say is that there's the omega K contribution. Yeah. When you integrate over K, you get turn number. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, uh, this type of uh, uh, strong temperature dependence of kappa x y by temperature. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you can you can get something like this by computing thermal hole conductivity coming from uh, the magnon contribution because magnon wave function has this very curvature. So the formula for the kappa x y by t mm -hmm. from the magnon contribution is very very similar. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that in in your formula. Uh, the another part of the integral doesn't depend on k, so that if you do the integral over k over omega k, you get a you get a churn number. Mm -hmm. But uh, for the magnon case, the, the rest of the integral it depends on momentum, so you don't directly get I churn see. number. Okay, yeah, yeah. And also you also need a two band because right. uh, for magnon, uh, total churn number has to be always zero. Yeah. So one of them is actually plus one, the other is minus one, that's just right. like that's what right. you're that's, right. that's right, yeah. So I think it's very, very similar. The overall yeah. temperature dependence yeah. is almost the same. Yeah. The only difference here is that uh, uh, you don't get, you don't directly get a churn number. You yeah. get some, I, I some the common, yeah. Yeah, yeah, smooth, except, except, yeah. smooth yeah. out version of the churn number. Right, right. Yeah, in fact, yeah, in fact, yeah. Th thanks for bringing up those points. But actually, you see, to, to talk about magnons, you know, we feel that it's only valid when you are above 10 Tesla. Because once you get below into the spin liquid phase in, in, in this branch here, right? Uh, the, the spectroscopy shows that the, the bands, if you want to ascribe them to magnons, the bands become very broad, right? So, you know, it's in this sort of difficult crossover region where the notion of magnons is starting to break down. No, I so agree. Then, There's a definitely a strong magnon decay. Yeah. But on the other hand, I think that the neutron scattering uh, data exists uh, only like above, only up to like seven or eight Tesla. Mm -hmm. And there's no neutron scattering data above that, as far as I know. And also, uh, uh, eventually, I know you said that, um, you know, basically uh, something else happens when field becomes very, very large. No way. So wait, in that uh, case, yeah. in that case, uh, what happens is that the magnon gap actually becomes very large. Very large, correct, correct. Yeah. So that so that as you as you pointed yeah. out, the magnon contribution is suppressed. Yeah, yeah. For that's such right. a large field, and that's yeah. consistent with your kappa x yeah, yeah. theta too. I think. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I completely agree with you that yeah. uh, the magnons are not well defined, but nonetheless, nonetheless, this behavior is very very similar to what we would get from uh, magnon thermal hole conductivity. Yeah. So Pozzoni, it you know it got to do with the Berry coverage and finite churn yeah, number. You need yeah. a two band with the opposite right. churn number, but that aspect is very very similar. Yeah. yeah. No. no th thanks for those remarks. Yeah. They, 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 yeah. Okay. So uh, um, let, let let me come back to the last slide, and this will incorporate some of that the points you are making, right? So uh, 
you, you see that when you plot the 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 magnitude of the planar Hall effect, uh, compare it with the uh, oscillation amplitude, you see that the, the two are they seem to be anti-correlated, right? When one is large, the other one is small. And so maybe, maybe we are in, in both experiments, we are looking at different populations of spin excitations, right? Uh, the oscillations we think are bulk, the, 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 and the fact that they show quantization uh, suggests strongly that they are fermionic, but they die out, they die out around four Kelvin. Uh, yeah, so this pertains to the earlier discussion. It fits the lifshitz koshlev kosovich form uh, and gives you the effective mass of 0.67. Uh, but the uh, edge modes, right, which is what's giving rise to the kappa xy, uh, as we have argued, are bosonic, right, and they appear. Now, maybe, maybe they can have a purely magnonic dis description, as Yongbeck said, in the presence of the Berry curvature. Uh, but, you know, the interesting possibility is that these two seem to be orthogonal aspects, right, of, of this complicated set of phenomena. And, and so I think it's quite interesting to separate them, them uh, carefully. And as I alluded to, uh, Peter is trying to convince me that there's something happening below four Kelvin. You see that uh, in this interesting field range, once you get below four Kelvin, it deviates again from the, uh, from the uh, Murakami plot uh, expression or the Magnon expression. And something else seems to be happening. Uh, uh, it, it could be that that reflects the increasing dominance of this fermionic uh, component. So that's all I want to say. And I hope uh, uh, this has been helpful in clarifying our findings. So to summarize, uh, we, we see quantum oscillations onset below four Kelvin. And, and Mine Li uh, tells me, Mine is my former postdoc, who did the very first uh, thermal conductivity measurements in early generations of ruthenium chloride. If she, if she looks carefully at her data at two Kelvin, she can also detect oscillations. Uh, anyways, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see her follow up. The amplitude is largest in the quantum spin liquid state, but it dies abruptly once you polarize all the moments. Um, it's periodic, uh, it's one over H. And, and this is very intriguing because it does suggest a quantum phenomenon quantization of areas in K-space. Um, so the, the most uh, interesting implication is that perhaps we are seeing neutral fermions, right, in, in this parton representation. So this remains to be confirmed, of course, but uh, it does open the door a crack. Uh, then coming to the planar thermal Hall effect, uh, we have carried out the experiment over a much, much larger temperature range going down to a base temperature of 0.3 Kelvin. So kappa xy is strongly temperature dependent or divided by T is strongly temperature dependent and it fits the bosonic picture, to give you a churn number of one. And that we feel is a fairly strong uh, invalidation of the half quantization claim. We, we are both looking, my, my group and Matsuda's group are looking at the same phenomenon, right? Because in this second paper, it's all about the planar thermal Hall effect. So, um, so the two data sets can be compared. And my, my point here is that it suffices to ask, is it temperature independent or dependent? And um, the inferred spin gap is closed in agreement with uh, electron spin resonance. So with that, uh, I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, thanks, Paul, for a very great talk. Uh, now let's come to questions. Uh, uh, one, can I uh, ask a question? If it's not embarrassing. No, no, no. Uh, I, I want to take you back to the uh, quantum oscillation part. Uh, that's something I didn't notice before, which you pointed out. So it seems that the oscillation actually scales with the high temperature plateau, which is 
phonon dominated, right? So the signal seems to be scale with a phonon signal. So that would suggest that uh, the oscillation is coming from oscillation in the phonon. Well, remember, which is somehow driven could be driven by some electronic, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. degree yeah. of freedom. But it's, yeah. I think it seems to say that you're not directly seeing oscillations from some from the phonon uh, from the uh, from the fermionic yeah. uh, spin on, for example. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that 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 is also our picture because you remember the. Spin and the phonons are strongly coupled. They're yeah. strongly scattering, right? Because yeah. here you see the great suppression. Yeah. So whatever happens to the electronic spectrum yeah. is bound to transfer over to the phonons. Yeah. yeah. But no, my, my point is not so much that the magnitude is scaling, but the resolution in the derivative, it, it becomes better and better. Yeah, yeah, but I think the fact that it's scaling is also an important hint. That, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, the yeah, it could, it could be phonon, this is mostly I from, yeah, I, 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 that is also our picture. It's the it's yeah. the phonon response to what's ever happening to the right. electronic spectrum. That, I mean, that, this may be related to the other point that I think I've made to you in private that uh, maybe I just uh, speak out now because, you know, the specific heat data says that if you apply the field along A, uh, the specific heat is exponentially small. Mm -hmm. um, even in this region of for, for Kelvin, it's already very, very small according to specific heat. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's actually nothing there to, to oscillate. Uh, yeah. um, so that, that's actually another puzzle that uh, one has to... Well, I mean, even, even discounting the heat capacity, the AC susceptibility also doesn't see the, our oscillations. The so, yeah. So you mean there's a spin gap? You think there's a spin gap? Yeah. 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 And right. um, we, we don't know. We don't know why why it's so hard to see it in the heat capacity. Um, um, but uh, yeah. So if you take a purely phononic point of view, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's it would be even more yeah. more of a intellectual challenge, right? To think about. Landau oscillations in a phononic system. Right, no, absolutely, of course, yeah. yeah. So you, 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 Patrick, if you don't mind my saying, you're trying to push all the theoretical challenge to us, whereas that's your job, right? No, no, I, I agree. Not, no, <laughs> our job is to make sure that the data yeah. is rock solid. Yeah, I, and yeah I'm not challenging the data. I'm just saying that this is even more, more mysterious than I think that. Well, that it, I, it's, I uh, it's, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so the next question is by Chen Zhou. Uh, Chen Zhou, please. Is it Chandra? Uh, Chen Zhou. Chen Zhou. Chandra? Unmute. unmute. You have to unmute. Uh, Chen Zhou, are you there? Uh, okay, uh, maybe Satan, you can ask the question first. Everyone, thanks for a, for a lovely talk. Um, um, so uh, I'm struggling with how to think about this Murakami uh, story. Uh, so, so your interpretation is that the strong temperature dependence of kappa xy over t uh, is somehow indicative of uh, bosonic modes. Um, so should I, you know, in the fermion case, I understand that if you fill a band with non-zero churn number, then you'll get this quantized thermal conductivity. So in the boson case, are you imagining that the bosons are, you know, sampling the entire Brillouin zone or what's... Uh... Something that has Brillouin zone. So in, in the boson case, for example, in the... Mag if these were all just simple magnons occupying topological bands, right? Then yeah, indeed they they, they have a B one zone, correct? Yeah, but you know, as Youngbeck was saying, the the contribution to something like a thermal hall will be weighted by whatever region of K space the bosons are occupying. Right? Uh, it will only come from th those portions. Uh, so I'm not sure what this model is assuming. In uh, this assumes the bosons are all over K space or yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at least that's that's the way. Well, I mean, it's uh, 
I think the K dependence doesn't come in. I think more of a concern is the K dependence of the Berry curvature. The, 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 the magnons presumably occupy a band, right? They will occupy a band that is filled in the bow with the Bose distribution. So yeah, they are all over K space, but they vary in energy. But that's given by this uh, epsilon of K. But the the Berry curvature could be strongly K dependent because it's usually right concentrated around Dirac points. Um, yeah. Okay. So, if I may say, maybe it looks like it's just that the energy dispersion is flat, so you can take it out of the integral, right? The lower limit of the integral. Yeah, but that would the be assumption. Assumption. That's correct. So if, if, if your magnum band is completely flat, so oh, that there's I no see. dispersion, then you just get a turn number. Yeah. But right. Because of the yeah, fact that, that it right. disperses, that. Yeah. because of the fact it disperses, you don't get a total turn number in the kappa XY. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Yeah, it's very peculiar that the planar thermal hall effect exists at all, you know, because <laughs> it, 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 you know, does it go, does it swing to the right or to the left? You, you can't tell because the magnetic field is parallel to the applied temperature gradient. But uh, like I said, we took, uh, you know, more than a year to try to get rid of it. And it's, uh, it, it just refuses to go away. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, it gets the cleaner you make the experiment, the larger it blooms. And, and this is a real signal. And it's not Lorentz like, it's basically just an edge mode, I think. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, I think uh, Chandra asked a question in the chat. So the question is the following uh, So the area for the oscillation, uh, if we interpret it uh, traditionally, is between. 1 over 100 and 1 over 1,000 of the brilliant zone. Correct, so I, correct. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's exactly like a semi-metal. Uh, if you were to measure the quantum oscillations of tantalum arsenide or bismuth, the field scale and uh, the field scale and the temperature scales look very similar. So yeah, just like in pure bismuth, it's, it's a very tiny fraction of the brilliant zone. Oh, okay. Uh, the next question is by Inti. Inti, please. Yeah, thanks very much for the nice talk. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about this first part where you showed the, the more recent sample that seems to have higher quality for the oscillations. The oscillations. No, no, the, the oscillations are the still the same, same as before. We, we, haven't, we haven't written up the cleaner okay. crystals yet. These, these that were published. Right, I see. So these two panels are, in principle, two samples. The, the one on the right-hand side has more quality in some sense. Oh, uh, we would say that sample three has a much higher quality than sample one. You mm -hmm. see, so this is the point I'm making, right? So the, the plateau value is three times higher and the amplitude is about four to five times higher. Is there any difference, you know, there, there was some a, a apparent two different frequencies as you enter the, the antiferromagnet, a, you know, the, the slope sort of breaks. Oh, the, the period, you mean? Right, the period of the oscillations. Do the, you see the, any the, between, between these two samples? Yeah, do you see any dependence of the no, no, period no, no, of no, oscillation? No, no, yeah, yeah. yeah, the frequency dependence is absolutely reproducible. So that's sample three in red and sample one in blue. So as you so you enter the zigzag phase at seven Tesla, and you see they are tracking each other. Okay. So despite the strong difference in frequency, uh, amplitude. Sorry, <laughs> it's getting mixed up. The, the strong difference in amplitudes, the frequency and phase are the same across okay. samples. Thank you. Oh, okay, uh, the next uh, question is by uh, Sira Hickey. Yeah, hi, hi. thanks. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask also about this um, uh, nice quantum oscillation uh, data. So 
you mentioned that a, a weekly onset at about four Tesla, and that's yeah. the same in both samples. I mean, in, as you can see in this yeah. Um, yeah. plot here. And, and so I guess that indicates that, I and mean, that would indicate that there's a potential phase transition at four Tesla. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you know of any other um, experiments on lithium chloride or any other experiments you've done that indicate that there's something interesting happening at Fort Tesla? Yeah, so the, uh, our collaborators at Oak Ridge, they, they of course have done a lot of neutron scattering. And, and Banerjee tells us that indeed you see something change at Fort Tesla. I think it's the, uh, the switching of the domains from three to two, I believe. Right, because there are, there are three domains at, at very weak mm -hmm. fields for the zigzag. But then they, mm -hmm. they switch to two, I forget now whether it's two or one, but something happens to the domain uh, structure. I see. So, so it's something that within the zigzag state, there's a reconstruction of the domains. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what the neutron scattering people tell us. Can I chime in? Sure. Uh, um, so the, what uh, the Oak Ridge group showed is that the intensity of the magnetic rag peak starts to decrease at four Tesla. Yeah. Uh, so the order is becoming weaker. Uh, there's like a kink there, basically, depending on how you plot it. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I think, thanks. All, all difficult questions should be directed at Peter. <laughs> thanks. Uh, OK, uh, the next one is uh, Andre. Andre, please. Uh, yes, this is Andrei Nevodomsky. Hi. Uh, hi, Fon. Wonderful talk. Um, my question is to the second part of the talk. When you plot kappa over t as a function of temperature, did you try to fit it as a power law, let's say between 2 and 10 Kelvin? Uh, our data, you mean? Yes, just the data without any fits. Uh, yeah, so it, it's manifestly not power law, right? So th this was the beginning of uh, head yes, scratching yes. for us. Uh, you see, it, it, it comes up, yeah, ignoring this uh, low, low temperature fluctuation, it comes up too steeply for even exponential. So it, the initial attempt by Peter was to fit this to a simple activation gap. And it, it, it was very difficult. It, it's just too mm -hmm. steep. But the Bose distribution is, of course, much steeper. So it seems to do the job. Right. Well, but it's not power law. Your power right. laws can be excluded. So, so the reason I ask is related to the comments made by Young Beck earlier. So if you take, a, let's say, a bosonic version of the Haldane model, you, you could do it by assuming bosons with DM interaction, Zelshinsky marie interaction on graphene, on graphene lattice. Then what you will see exactly like Young Beck and Sentil were suggesting is that the most of the Berry curvature would actually come from where the crossings were, typically the minimum of, of your gap. Mm -hmm. And so if you look analytically at what kappa x, y over t looks like, it typically looks like square root of t mm -hmm. times an exponential. Mm -hmm. So what would enter in your exponential would be what you'd call a spin gap from ESR, it would be around 10 Kelvin. Mm -hmm. So there will be an exponential prefactor, right? Which is what um, you refer to as a bosonic function. Mm -hmm. And then multiplying that would be some power law of temperature. Um, and, and so that might give you more indication of what what is the, the distribution of the Berry curvature? So what I'm saying is not new, it's all in Murakami's papers essentially. Um, but given that we don't have a microscopic model for what the magnons are, mm -hmm. one could try and see if we could back out that information just by trying to fit the temperature dependence of the data. Well, so, uh, we will soon release all this data and we would invite, we'll be happy to send the data for fitting here. So we, we hope that indeed there will be considerable theoretical activity because you know Peter spends a lot of time and we burn up a lot of liquid helium collecting this full set right so th there's actually a lot of rich data to be analyzed yeah yeah so you know, your comments are indeed helpful okay the next one is by Ting Yuan Chen Ting Yuan please oh um, thank you for this very interesting talk um, so, uh, um, with Steve Kivelson and Xiao Xi, we've been working on uh, the extrinsic phonon thermal hall effect on uh, other materials, which uh, in which um, large thermal hall effect has been observed recently. And I think, at least in those other materials, there are some good evidence that the large thermal hall effect is due to um, extrinsic skew scattering 
of phonons. And uh, depending on the uh, nature of those skill scatterers, some of those features, uh, such as this um, sort of exponential function of the temperature dependence and so on, uh, can also appear. And uh, also, uh, one important feature of extrinsic effect is they are typically much larger than the intrinsic very phase effects. So I'm wondering if there is any efforts one can make to check whether the contribution comes from some intrinsic sort of very curvature like contribution or some extrinsic mechanism from scattering. Yeah, so we have checked the data that you mentioned about thermal hall effects from insulators. And we don't seem to get that. We, we can't duplicate those experiments. We, we think, we think, uh, see, uh, there are quite a few groups now doing thermal hall conductivity. And there is a lazy man's way to do it and the right way to do it. And uh, experimental groups don't, don't show the dirty laundry, right? So we, uh, yeah, we can't seem to get their results at all. You know, these huge uh, thermal hall signals observed in everything, right? Undoped cuprates, um, strontium titanate, so on and so forth. We can't seem to duplicate them. And, and I'll be happy to say more, but uh, yeah, that, that's my response. Yeah. So, but for this material in particular, um, so, if, if, um, regardless of other material, for this material, uh, is there? It's still interesting to see if this can can be uh, carried by extrinsic mechanism of phonons, yeah. which are typically much larger than any intrinsic mechanism, like by orders of magnitudes. Yeah. So we 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 haven't explored that. Yeah, but but what your 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 data is uh, independent of sample, right? This this signal is it. Yeah. It's the same for, for example, with different amount of uh, disorder. Yeah, as measured by the plateau value. The plateau, yeah, so that yeah. would seem to rule out any yeah. extrinsic yeah. origin. Yeah, okay. that's right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, th these are very tiny kappa XY signals. Yeah, one thing I should mention is that the quantum oscillation experiments are 100 times easier than the planar thermal hall effect because the signals are very large. So the planar thermal hall effect is a very tiny signal. Um, and as Patrick said, it's independent of sample quality. So, yeah, so that's, that's the reply. Okay, uh, the next question is by Jonah. Hi, thanks. Um, um, I just just sort of adding on to this discussion that um, I was wondering if you could comment on uh, some work from Louis Taiefe from uh, back in, I think around 2005, they were discussing some of those cuprate signals and discussing this temperature dependence, which reminds me a little bit of, of their data where they find that it actually arises in the electron phonon coupling to the bath. Um, I don't know if, if you're aware of this work, but I was wondering if you could comment on this possibility. Yeah, th th that was my previous comment. Okay. Yeah, yeah I already commented on that. Yeah. We, gotcha. we think that, uh, yeah, so it's, it, it's uh, the thermal hall effect is a very difficult measurement. And uh, so as theorists, right? So I think, I think the majority of the audience are theorists. As theorists, you should always ask the, incisive questions. How did you measure the signal and what is lambda xy? What's the data for lambda xy and how you measure it? So that, that I, I haven't really dug into all the details that bedevil such measurements. Uh, for example, uh, magneto, magneto caloric effects, hysteresis, so on and so forth. Um, yeah, that would take an hour. And, and so when people just publish Kappa XY data without telling you what they did, um, you, you should take it with a grain of salt. Uh, okay, we, we have another question from Gongchen. 
Gontran, you can ask. Uh, thanks very much. So I have a question about this oscillation in uh, kappa xy. So uh, in thermal conductivity, when you apply field, so is this oscillation only appears when you field apply in plane? Can it appear in other direction of the field? Yes, yes, yeah, uh, correct. So uh, if you tilt the field out of the plane, let's say by 30 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. You can see the oscillations as well, but mm -hmm. the period, depends only on the component of the field along the A axis. I see, I see. How about, how about in like B direction, but in plane? In, in plane, you can see the oscillations. Yeah, in fact, I showed the data for the in plane. Hold on, let's see. Yeah, so the green circles are the in plane with field along the B axis and they match in the zigzag phase, but they, they have a larger Fermi surface in the high field phase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this can also be seen in the derivative. Yeah, so you see that the lines are more crowded when you- I see, I see. So if you, I see, I see. If you apply field normal to the plane, there's uh, no signature of oscillation. Is it clear? We we don't know. We didn't do that. Although the original, yeah, that's a that's a good question. Uh, we uh, yeah, from the trend of the data, we didn't really do that. The trend of the data would tell us that the the periods become so long that yeah, they kind of wash away. Yeah. So one comment that I would have is, uh, so this material is a uh, maybe not exactly you know two dimension like. Mm -hmm. There's uh, you know, some amount of interlayer coupling between. Mm -hmm. Sure, between sure. Them, yeah, yeah. The layer distance is not really far. Right. So one may worry if you apply field in the plane, so the the cross rest cross section is large, so the magnetic flux is large for a small amount of magnetic field. Yeah. If the sorry, if you. Yeah, so you apply field in plane. So the in plane, you your clock section clock section of the if you if you make up a loop mm -hmm. uh, uh, between the layers, mm -hmm. so the area is a little bit uh, larger than the other loop. So there can be a possibility of oscillation if you consider, for example, re exchange between the spin degree of freedom. Yeah, it, is, it seems like the the uh... The Fermi, if it's really a Fermi surface there, it's not strictly two-dimensional. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we agree. We think we think that the the C axis uh, exchange probably uh, introduces coupling. And so it, it's the third direction that has to come in. So the Fermi mm -hmm. surface could indeed be either a direct pocket or something, you know, something three-dimensional. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, Andrew has another question. Uh, Fon, I, I wanted to very quickly follow up on Gang's question. Um, so same question as Gang, but asking about the thermal hole. Mm -hmm. Presumably it appears, as you said, also for different field directions. So at the same time, you emphasize that the field was implied in plane and it was somewhat strange because of the absence of Lorentz force mm -hmm. to see the thermal hole signal. Mm -hmm. So, so is is the reason for why field applied in AB plane? Is that because that's the direction that suppresses the zigzag order? Did you try to apply the field along C or perpendicular to AB? Um, we did. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So you think did we did we do the, the thermal hall measurements with the field tilted out of the plane? Is that the question? Exactly. Yes. And do you see the same behavior? Peter, uh, do you want to take this question? Um, there was a small amount of data, um, not enough to do like temperature fits to, um, it was actually done by Tong, not by me. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So Tong, Tong was a few, yeah. we, we did not concentrate on the out of plane yeah. direction. Yeah, that, that, that's true. And, that, and that, can, yeah, that can be done. Yeah. Easy. And was the fundamental reason for that? Or, or maybe this just because historically Matsuda's data was in for the in plane field? 
No, well, because the, you know, as I said, the, the signal was so unexpected. And then let me go on to the, mm -hmm. to this the data. That, that this appearance of the planar thermal hall signal was so unexpected and mm -hmm. so strange that it's clear that we wanted to focus our, all the firepower on mm -hmm. flashing this out. Yeah, so mm -hmm. that's the basic reason. Yeah, okay. Because it, it, that, that's where the anomaly really is. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So that's, that's what we wanted to explore. Excellent, thanks. Oh, okay. Chindra said uh, he has another question. Uh, let me try to find it. Uh, Chindra, I'm not sure I can find it. Oh, okay, I'll find it. So the so question by Chandra is, uh, why is the background constant thermal connectivity uh, presuming Presumably due to phonons being demin diminished in the region of the oscillations. Uh, come again, read again. Okay, so the question is, uh, why is the background uh, constant thermal connectivity due to phonons? Uh, well, okay. Uh, well, you mean I, I, in, I'm, I'm not presumably, sure this is uh, a question. <laughs> who, who's asking, Chandra? Uh, Chandra, Chandra. Yeah. Uh, presumably, in, in our uh, uh, interpretation, yeah, so for example, here, uh, let's see, the other one's better. Yeah, because of the, of the very intense uh, spin phonon scattering, right, that, that, that happens here, uh, the fact that it's now independent of a magnetic field suggests to us that the spin scattering is not only down, but the, uh, um, the, the spin excitations are also strongly suppressed. So the, the only thing left are the phonons and it, it's uh, field independent, right? So without, without, if the field cannot change the spin excitation population, magnon population, or uh, the magnon gap becomes too large to be relevant, then there's nothing to scatter the phonons. And, and feel by itself per se should not change the phonon conductance. So we're reasoning on that basis. I think that's what the question's about. I'm not sure. Uh, I yeah, I think the question is about the intermediate region, the quantum spin liquid regime. So the question oh, is- here, here. Yeah, why oh, is- Oh, here, there? that's very strong spin phonon interaction, yeah. Okay. So as Patrick pointed out that, you know, maybe the oscillations are from the phonons reflecting the electronic spectrum of the electrons. Yeah. So we cannot rule that out. It could be indeed coming from modulation of the phonon current due to changes in the electronic spectrum. Hey, Paul, may I add one point about that? Yeah. This is Lou. Yeah. You showed the lift is because of its fit, right? Yeah. Beautifully, right? Yeah. Phonon population should drop dramatically in T cube. Phonon, come again? Phonon population or phonon contribution should drop dramatically, right? I'm, 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 I, I guess what, what, I'm trying, what, what I'm trying to understand, if you have something follow what you expected out of fermion, why do you need additional channel coupled to boson in terms of temperature dependence? Yeah, I guess I'm not for I'm not getting your assumptions. What 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 are the starting assumptions that you you showed that your oscillation pattern yeah. follow what's expected out of fermion? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Why do you need to couple to a boson to get that temperature dependence? That's my question. Oh, because the electronic spectrum is uh, uh, being damped out very rapidly. No, but I think that, sorry for interjecting, but I think that the question is that how this graph, this, the blue curve of yeah. this graph is compatible with the graph that you have shown just a minute ago, um, which is about uh, where, the, 
where the oscillation seem to be getting stronger with higher, at higher temperature. Oh, I no, think. no, that, 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 that is the trivial temperature dependence that, that, that is attached, appended to all kappa measurements. Yeah, let me go back. Yeah, yeah, okay. So the, 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 this is... Uh, yeah, this one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so, the, uh, so the, this is just a naked kappa XX. Sometimes uh, Peter divides by T, sometimes he doesn't, depending on his mood when he, oh, well, I guess he wants to display, make sure that the curves do not cover each other. Uh, so uh, if you, if you uh, so we, when we plotted out the Lifshitz uh, form, we are actually extracting the amplitude, not, not the total graph. So we, we, we are extracting, we're sitting at one field value, let's say nine Tesla, and we are extracting the amplitude uh, of the oscillation versus temperature. And then I think the plot divides out the temperature. So uh, I don't know, Leonard, maybe you can explain what, what, you, what you mean by it goes away at four Kelvin. Uh, no, it, it wasn't me who asked about for Kelvin, but my point is that it looks like uh, uh, here you have a decay of delta K is temperature. Uh, and on the graph, I mean, visually, it looks like actually the oscillation amplitude goes up with temperature. So yeah, maybe. Yeah, okay. Yeah, no, it's the same point. Yeah, it, it's just that, you know, the, the, the background itself is actually changing right so what we did was we divided yeah. up we the normalized it to the background yeah what was plotted there was normalized to the background okay thanks yeah. uh, okay uh Chandra had a following up question so uh he wants to confirm that the oscillations are in the scattering rate is that true oscillations are in the scattering rate so at this point we cannot um uh, parse the experiment to that kind of detail. So all we know is that if you change the quality of the lattice as uh, measured by this proxy in a plateau, the oscillation amplitude changes as well, just like it does in the ordinary Shubnikov the Haas experiment. So that's, that's the extent to which we can, we can comment on lifetime. Yeah, uh, I think it's quite late now. So is there any other question? Okay, uh, if not, let's thank uh, Professor Pong again for a very great talk. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank, you thank you, Pong. And uh, thanks everyone. Okay, so I'm, Thank you I'm very much. Really done, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So okay. thank you a lot. <laughs> okay. A great talk. Yeah, pretty long talk. It's almost like a talk in the Landau Institute. <laughs> uh, it's quite a normal here in this seminar series. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's very exciting result. Yeah, thank you, Fang. <laughs> hi, hi, Xiaogang. Hi. <laughs> I tried to read your book, but uh, <laughs> no. still on page two. <laughs> Thanks, Juan. It was wonderful. Actually, why, uh, Juan, why I have you here? Can I ask a simple question? Sure. So, well, for the quantum oscillations, when you apply the field in A or B direction, what is the direction of the heat current? Is it always along the field, or, or is it fixed? We we um, we it depends on the experiment, right? So we always apply the heat current along the A axis, zigzag. Always A axis. Ah, yeah, I see. Because of the crystal structure. I see. So, so the, the, field, the field can be varied. Yeah. I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. But then, you know, as you pointed out, A and B are not orthogonal. So if you apply Correct. a field along B, there's also a component along A. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. would that, that should be thought about. Yeah. That, 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 that should be considered. Yeah. yeah. That should be considered. Yeah. 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 Because I, like, I exactly. didn't think of that before. I always thought it was orthogonal. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the next generation will involve rotating the field in the AB plane. Yeah, but well, you, ha you have basically done that, right? We, we oh, only did a discrete, discrete 
Yeah, you have you have two points. Yeah, we, we need to we need to do a more complete study. Yeah, and also maybe can you send the heat along B when you that is possible. Yeah, I think that should be possible. Yeah. We yeah, there's no technical uh, barrier to that. Yeah, well, I don't know what it means, but it's just offhand. But you know, by, by the on saga theorem, it is the same, right? Should be the same. Otherwise, otherwise we have to worry about. The on saga theorem. Kappa uh, xy y should be kappa yx hmm. with a change of sign. I'm sorry, no, no, this is kappa xx. Oh, for the quantum oscillations. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, we should we should think about that. We haven't, so, we haven't explored. Yeah, so it's, again, for the quantum oscillation for kappa xx, the, the heat is always along a. Yeah, yeah. The heat. I think I think this is correct. Uh, Peter, can you can you verify that? No, he's, he's gone off he's air, gone. offline. Yeah, I think so. I think it's always long a axis. Yeah, mm -hmm. because the crystals like to grow longer along zigzag for some reason. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's that's something to think about. Yeah, we, we I think we can do that because the. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have quite. A, I wonder at a lower temperature whether there could be a case where the magnetron contribution is bigger than phonon contribution. Uh, for the kappa xx. I think at the moment you're thinking the kappa xx mainly come from phonon and uh, the spinon part just uh, modulate yeah. the resistance. Yeah. Yeah. But at the lower temperature, the phonon contribution may be very small. And then whether there's a possibility which uh, a spinon contribution would, uh, would be bigger than phonon. That so you want reason. us to go below 0.3 Kelvin? Yeah, I wonder what, yeah, I don't know which temperature, but so maybe I can estimate it. At which yeah. temperature actually the phonon became very small. And what I will see must come from spinon. Or maybe spinon even became even smaller. So you'll never see spinon contribution in kappa XX. No, that's see, but that's an interesting thing. If yeah. you compare the data, uh, let, let, let me go back to that. Yeah, yeah let, let's see this data. Uh, you see, as you as you go to our lowest temperature, the relative strength of the oscillations, right, mm -hmm. relative to the total background, is okay. very large. You yeah. See the black curve. So I think you know, you might be right. If you go down to let's say 0.1 Kelvin, it, it could truly dominate. Yeah, okay. I think I think that's that's a direction we're trying to push. We we can do it if yeah, and, and with more yeah, a little bit of. Change. Yeah, but my, my trouble with that is that uh, is that that's that signal seems to scale with the phonon signal at the plateau. So if it's if it's two separate contribution, you would not expect that. Right? Wait, wait, Patrick, look, 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 compare the green curve and the black, right? So they differ by a factor of two in temperature. Yeah. The the magnitude of these oscillations is you know is about a, a fifth of the plateau. Here, the magnitude is about close to a third to a half, right, of the plateau. So they, they are scaling. Yeah, so this, actually, Peter has the data that we could chase it down. We could mm -hmm. now make a serious comparison between the relative strengths yeah. of all the oscillations and anchor them or compare them to the plateau. That, that's a good idea, actually. We should do that. We should do that. I think the data is all there. Yeah, well, you can see it by eye. The kind of scale, I mean, uh, not really. Uh, like, like I said, right? This is it's on a sloping background. So it's a little tricky. Yeah. No, no. I mean, you take the difference. The difference mm -hmm. defines the amplitude. Yeah. So, the, so I would say the kind of scale. Mm. Well, at a six tesla, the black curve and the red curve have a similar amplitude. That's right. Yeah. 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 At the low temperature. Yeah. At the at, at six tesla, they they seem to not scale. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. even here, even even here, the largest oscillation, yeah. it's not scaling because yeah. the the phonon uh, background that doesn't respond to the oscillation is uh, yeah. is very large at, at yeah. above one kelvin. Yeah, but that's a good idea. We we should quantify this now, and I think yeah. I think I'm going to not allow Peter to graduate until he analyzes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we didn't do that. Great damage. <laughs> but he has all the data, so he can he can do that. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a very useful point. We should really focus in on that. Okay. So, so Juan, did you say that in uh, the AC 
measurement there is a spin gap in this region? Uh, the, the, from fitting to Murakami's expression, we can extract a spin gap in this region. Yeah, I think I, think I showed that data. Yeah, yeah, but you also said, I think, uh, as a comment. Oh, we're not calling it a spin gap, right? It's just the energy scale. Right. Because the, the Magnon, if we can still use a Magnon language, must be very broad in this region. Mm -hmm. So it's basically the center of this very broad band. It's an energy scale, yeah. And that, but didn't you say that there's some AC magnetization measurement which saw a gap? Come again, if they, if. Uh, maybe I misheard you, but I thought you said that there was some AC magnetization. No, 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 it's the electron spin resonance. Oh, I see, okay. And there's a gap that's seen in the ASO? They don't call it a gap, it's a resonance signal at that energy, but the, the you notice that the bands are getting broader and broader. So, I mean, the, the uh, yeah. The energy levels, so yeah, we, we should we should pull out the width of that. Yeah. So who, who, whose data is that? ESR. Uh, many actually. Let me see. Hmm? There's, There's a lot. Three, I think three or four groups. Let me see. Oh, did he? Uh, Peter did not report the. Uh, Mm -hmm. Well, I'll send you the references. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, the three be great. reports. Yeah, separated by a few years. Yeah. Yeah, I see. Because somehow this uh, spin resonance, it can be a very powerful way to measure the uh, the spin gap. I mean, and people have, you know, they, yeah. they have uh, they also terahertz measurements. Yeah, yeah. But I yeah, think it was done for the organics. I was very impressed with the data. That yeah. It really shows clearly that the gap in the yeah in the, in the ET. Liquid. Okay. Okay. If there are no other questions, I think maybe. Uh, yeah. I'm there of lunch. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Good seeing you. Thank you. you. Yeah. Nice to see you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay.